Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Morning Light Bible Study. This is the Morning Light Bible Study where for almost four years now, I think we're coming up on four years, we've gotten our whole Bible back. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> and we love our Morning Light because we learn so much and we get to apply it, not just learn it, but apply it. <laughs> It's a real blessing. Um, sad, sad news for those of you who haven't seen it on the internet today. Our friend Kim Clement has made an exit and now is in heaven where he's healed. But we are sure going to miss him. There are just not enough prophetic voices in the earth and he is seriously going to be missed. And uh, we're praying for his wife Jane and their whole crew. We are partners with them and we are not going to stop partnering with them just because Kim Clement changed his address. So I just would like to encourage you all, um, hug your prophet today. Love your prophet. Pray for your prophet. It's very important. I take it so seriously. We don't want to be one day without them because they're a voice of God to us. So please honor, respect, and pray for your prophets. Yes, here at Father's Heart Ministry, we are not a non-profit organization. <laughs> we believe in the prophets. <laughs> Unlike some I know. <laughs> <laughs> who re who will remain unnamed for now but you know who you are <laughs> god bless kim clement yeah his memory years ago kitty came to me she said uh we need to give our vacation money to kim clement and we had saved for weeks Months. To get months, <laughs> to just get a thousand dollars together to go on vacation. And we sat down and we wrote a letter and we sent it to Kim and we said, we want this to be given to Kim personally. And they called us back. They said, well, you won't get a, a tax write off if you do that. And we said, we want this to be laid at his feet. We don't care about that part. <laughs> and we wrote him a little note and we said, Kim, well, this is a, our unconditional gift to you. But if you are prompted to pray for us, we would ask that you would pray for us. We have a desire to be full-time in the ministry. And I will uh, never forget, we were on the road uh, and uh, traveling somewhere. And, and the phone started ringing. And so someone uh, on the other line, one of our supporters in the early days of our ministry, he said, it's you, isn't it? It's you, uh, Kim Clement. Uh, in his broadcast, an hour and 45 minutes and 26 seconds in, he talks about Russ and Kitty. And so he went and looked it up and he he talked about our gift. He didn't mention our last name, but he talked about, here's a thousand dollars from Russ and Kitty. And they didn't ask for a million dollars. They just asked to be, to lay their lives down for the gospel. And the Lord's going to grant the thing that they requested. Four months later, we were full-time in the ministry. Amen. Thank God for the prophetic Amen. voice. And we started out by learning how, we, I, I heard Graham Cook talk about giving in to your future, giving toward your future. You find someone that has an anointing that if you had your version of that anointing, it would be a promotion to you. It would be a furtherance mm -hmm. of the, and an enlargement of the thing that God called you to do. It may not be that exact thing because we're nothing like Kim Clement. But yet we gave into that anointing because if we had our version of what he was doing, it would have been a promotion to us. And it was there's there was a direct connection to making that happen. And it's so, so blessed us. And Kim was prophetic. I believe he went all the way back to the early day the, the latter days rather of the PTL and certainly the he early sure days did. of TBN. Yeah. He was doing this um longer than anybody I know, longer than some of the, the patriarchs that have been at this from the eighties. Kim was doing this then. Uh, he was prophetic when prophetic wasn't cool. Amen. And he, was. and he has been through a lot of shifts and changes and always stuck with and was a great champion of Israel. Mm -hmm. And it just touches my heart. And uh, we we just we wouldn't bring him back if we could. No. Because I'm sure he's he's like, that's OK. I, uh, I appreciate you I'm loving good. me, but I'm good where <laughs> I'm, I'm at. Good. <laughs> But we just want to honor him. Yes. We've been partnering with his ministry, as Kitty said, for quite a while. And 
We're not no. going to stop now no. just because he he uh, because he has a widow and and, and widowed right. children now and, and uh, bereft children and I know they're grown and they're all work in that ministry but they God have, bless them. Yeah, they've had the little ones that they've adopted from China with them. Uh, medical needs that they brought over. They have a, a cr- incredible history of taking care and adopting children, so they definitely need to be remembered. And I, I just want to say this. I don't want to take much time, but when John Paul Jackson died, God spoke to me. He said, there's poison in the pot. And I went back to when Elijah went to heaven, Elisha received the mantle, and he connected with the school of the prophets. And when he connected with the school of the prophets, with the mantle he received from Elijah, they were about they were going to share a meal together, which represents covenant. But yet, uh, someone cried out that there were poison gourds that had inadvertently been put in the pot, and he cried out to the man of God, "O oh, man of God, there's poison in the pot." And Elisha took some meal. And remember, the scripture teaches about the meal offering. He took meal and he cast it into the pot. And it healed the pottage. Mm-hmm. And when uh, and we've had so many. Miles Monroe. David Wilkerson died a horrible death uh, that Ratliff. the news didn't even report on. Mm-hmm. Michael Ratliff, who most people don't know, but he was the prophet who prophesied to Steve Hill to go to Pensacola. There was going to be a revival there. And uh, John Paul Jackson, taken out before his time and uh, others as many others more than I can uh, I can mention that uh, have come to mind and anything that makes you do a double take pray to interpret and I heard the father say there's poison in the pot not that God killed these men I'm saying when we're transitioning a generational mantle has been passed just like Elijah to Elisha, a generational mantle. God's raising up a company of prophets and the enemy's conspiring to put poison in the pot. And we need to identify that. And the meal is a message. That's right. The meal is a message that God is speaking mm-hmm. through the prophetic. And it's time for us to rise up and to be that. Uh, else these things uh, continue it. These things don't go away. You think it's it's just some random happenstance no. that these primary voices in the prophetic have been snuffed out prematurely? And Kitty, you're absolutely right. Pray for the because the prophets are being raised up. We're about Ricardo. We're about to finish in the earth. The prophets are about to finish. The laying down of an apostolic foundation that will open the door for the apostles to rise up in that very moment when the prophets then will have to decrease like John made room for Jesus. And he said, I must decrease. We're about to step across that threshold of the of the decreasing season and that apostolic forerunner. Uh, role is about to be completed and the enemy is trying to kill off the prophetic. That's right. But he can't get it done. Just Jesus like John the Baptist. Lord. <laughs> David Wilkerson initiated the restoration of the prophets to the mo- to modern times when he stood up in the 1980s and declared himself to be a prophet and immediately repudiated it like within a month. But it didn't matter. He did it. Mm-hmm. And what happened to the very first prophet after the days of Malachi, 400 silent years? John the Baptist, what happened? He lost his head. What happened to David Wilkerson? He went in a head-on collision and was decapitated. Now you tell me that God is not saying something to us. God didn't do that, Mm -hmm. but the enemy coming against, and we need to be able to read the circumstance and see that the enemy has been coming against. And David Wilkerson died and there was not a whisper. Very few, even in the prophetic move, even Mm -hmm. acknowledged that David Wilkerson had passed on. We need to think about these things. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be men and women of understanding of the times. Something is happening. And it's important that we wrap this up with intercession. Because I believe these things were not necessary. I don't think John the Baptist had to go the way he did. And I don't think Kim Clement or John Paul Jackson or Miles Monroe or others had to die as they died. Mm-hmm. And we need to pray into these things. And if you're an intercessor to intercede, never take for granted intercession. Mm-hmm. 
Amen. for the prophets that are in your midst. <clears throat> Good point. Kim, uh, Chris said that Kim's was brain surgery, another head injury. So we want the Lord to keep your head covered and all of our prophet friends. We've got to love your prophet and pray for your prophets. See, it's just like Herod trying to kill all the babies. Does not the scripture say in Revelation that there will be a massive head wound to the beast, to the Antichrist? It does. And what does the enemy do? He tries to perpetrate it ahead of time mm -hmm. against the people of God. That's right. We really do need to pray into these things and think about these things. Thank you, Father. Today, and the narrative drives the experience because today we're talking about the brevity of life and talking about those that, that go on to their reward. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I titled the study today, No, Never Alone. In chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes, Solomon gives an unvarnished, unapologetic assessment of the vanity of life outside of Christ. Though we might, by providence, live a full life with many experiences, be much loved by all. In the end, it's all a vapor when we face the yawning chasm of our own mortality. The world, and sadly most Christians, bury their head in the sands of oblivion to the truths that Solomon refused to ignore. All is vanity, vanity, vexation of spirit outside the reality of a life poured out like a drink offering at the foot of the cross. Now, you're going to hear people, if you talk about Ecclesiastes, you're going to hear people, it's going to come out of their mouth. It's an inspired record of uninspired sayings. And you need to be prepared to say, no, it's not. <laughs> All scripture. It's an analysis <laughs> of the human condition outside of Christ and a very accurate one. So Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses one through five, uh, four, please. Okay. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun and behold the tears of such as were oppressed and they had no comforter and on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore, I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Yea, better is he that both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again, I considered all travail and every right work for that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. So in chapter 4, Solomon takes up the difficult subject of suffering and oppression. These are, these are the scandalous objections that unbelievers cast in the teeth of God's mercy, such as, if God exists, why do little babies die? Or if God exists, why does he allow war, famine, earthquake, etc.? Summoning up all the prowess of his prodigious God-given intellect, Solomon faces these things head-on in the book of Ecclesiastes without equivocating. And for his troubles, he has been denigrated by lesser men, theologians and scholars who insist that in the very taking up of these issues, Solomon is simply not hearing from God, but is, in their view, speaking from an unenlightened, uninspired, jaded viewpoint. To this, I would vociferously object. The reader must take into account that in all of Solomon's observations, the context of his words is given in consideration of the plight of man under the sun. In other words, leaving out the consideration of a loving, caring God who is intimately involved in every matter that pertains to us. He's saying to us what Paul said, if we in this life only have hope, we are of all men most miserable. And he's underscoring it for us. Now, in verse 1, Solomon compares the plight of the oppressed and the oppressor. He says, the oppressed don't have a comforter. And then he says, as a matter of fact, the oppressors don't have a comforter. Mm -hmm. So the plight of the oppressed and the plight of the, the, plight of the oppressor is the observation that there's not, no comforter to be found for them. Who is the comforter? The Holy Spirit, of course, Amen. which Jesus came to bring us. Is it not an indication? Now think about this. Where else in the Bible is there any reference to God as comforter this direct? So it's an indication to us 
of the familiarity that Jesus certainly had with the book of Ecclesiastes for him to choose the descriptor comforter to denote the very heart of his mission in regard to what he came to bring us. He came that we might have a comforter. There is no comfort to the oppressed, but likewise there's no comfort to the oppressor, Solomon observes. The rich do not sleep any better than the poor, and the rich get that. People that have, as one of my mentors makes a statement, he says there's only one class of people that think about money more than the rich, and that is the poor. He said, in fact, the poor can think of nothing else. But people that have this world's goods, they understand the transient nature of it. Uh, they understand that that uh, money is is not that which is the core uh, conduit of happiness. That's right. Uh, they, the, the rich don't sleep any better than the poor. And those that know fame and fortune as their portion, the wealthy, the famous, uh, those that know fame and fortune as their portion demonstrate no greater composure in life. In fact, they universally demonstrate the dysfunctional condition whereby their riches only afford them the dubious capacity to immerse themselves into what at the end of their days when facing their maker, they will only conclude is vanity, vanity, all is vexation and vanity. Again, comes the sobering thought that I experienced from the very first day I laid flowers on my mother's grave. Looking around in the cemetery at the forgotten dead, I heard the dread angel declare in my ears, if it doesn't matter here, it doesn't matter. What weight would we not give in the shadow of death to all those things that have so foolishly occupied our minds mm. in the oblivion of the mundane daily existence that many times thinks no deeper than the next cup of coffee or the next social interaction? Let me give an example. Take Steve Jobs. For instance, here is the man, here's a man of the world, a great inventor, who is no doubt influenced, personally influenced by his innovation, every single person in the developing, in the developed world, in, in the Western world, certainly. A great inventor, an innovator who brought us the Apple computer. In the last days of his life, again, died before his time. But yet in the last years of his life, he reconstituted the focus of his company to bring it to even higher heights by turning to the smartphone market and revitalizing the tablet industry. Smartphones had already, the death knell had already been sounded over smartphones. Tablets had already been considered passe. Mm -hmm. And Steve Jobs stepped in and single-handedly revitalized these two entire industries and made them core technologies by which communication takes place in the developed world. These are no small feats for this man, but into this man's life, that shadow of his own mortality stretched long, and upon his premature death, what accolades could he take into eternity to lay at the master's feet in hopes of gaining whatever grace is accessible on the other side of the grave. Did he come in and hand Jesus an iPhone? <laughs> Did he offer a iPad to St. Peter? You see what's important and what's not important, but those things yet that so occupy our lives. Is heaven, is eternity going to take stock of how many likes we put <laughs> on a Christian, or how many times we reposted a picture of Jesus? <laughs> For those of us who are of the community of faith, we realize what Solomon saw. The comfort that he observed was so lacking to both the small and the great in their lives of desperation. That comfort is given to us in Christ. We have the comforter. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a vital reality that while we cannot quantify the same to the skeptical world, who, which of us would not? In other words, the world doesn't believe that Jesus is in our heart. The world believes that religion, and specifically evangelical experiential religion, 
based on a crisis experience of being born again and being indwelled by the Spirit of God, they see that as the opiate of the masses. So this indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that's such a vital reality to us that we absolutely cannot quantify to the skeptic how many of us would not, although the world laughs at us, how many of us would not lay our lives on the crimson altar of self-sacrifice rather than deny the indwelling glory of a loving God who we know, though the world denies, that he lives on the inside of us. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 5 through 12, please. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both of the hands full with travail and vexation. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end to all his labor? Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither say, saith he, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of the good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. There, too, are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. But if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him! that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not help another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. Now think about that. Matthew 18, that, that threefold cord concept is so powerful that the enemy lobbies against it. Why do you think the enemy has deceived the church into accepting a religious culture by which we come together and sit and look at the back of someone else's head for 45 minutes to an hour or however long. Why do you think the enemy has so uh, dampened down and discouraged the interaction of brothers and sisters in Christ? I remember the day when I d began to see in the early days of before the internet was really the internet, I saw what was coming. And I immersed myself in the technology and I saw the power of it. And I would tell my friends, my, those, my mentors in the prophetic, and they would say, I wouldn't have one of those things in my house. That's the Antichrist. There's a beast computer over in Switzerland. That's the mark of the beast. And it was years. It was five to 10 years out. And even today, 60 to 70% of Christian leaders, when they're polled, they say they do not believe that a meaningful spiritual interaction can take place on the internet because the enemy impedes by a religious spirit the innovation of believers in the areas of communication, coming together, connecting, relating. Uh, when I, In the early days when uh, I would get online and I would find online forums, almost universally the only forums I could find were LGBT forums of homosexuals or white supremacists. You see, the enemy will take those that are bound captive by their lifestyles and he will absolutely encourage them to come together, to, to go in those directions and to gather together and innovate, communicate and build these networks and structures because he knows it only furthers and deepens the captivity in their lives. But believers, on the other hand, he pushes them aside. Oh, no, you don't want to do that. that that's the devil. He absolutely uh, uh, makes every effort to impede innovation in the body of Christ. And we fall for it. Hook, line, and sinker, unfortunately, far too many times. The threefold cord. How many friends do you have that you can know will lay their lives down for you? I mean, regardless of all the the many people that come together, but how many of those that you're actually wrapped up in one another's lives like that threefold cord? And and even among, you'd think, among the, the uh, among women, the, the gentler sex, that there would be more commonality. There would be more fraternity. But for all the lack of fraternity that I see among men, it's even more so among women. Because God knows what happens whenever women get together and pray. God knows what happens whenever women get together and they're not backbiting each other. Amen. 
when they're not ripping each other apart. The enemy wants to impede that. The enemy wants to keep you from coming together, my sister, in fraternity with other sisters of the Lord. He wants to keep you separate. He wants to keep you insecure. He wants to keep you competitive. He wants to keep you from being one with your sisters in Christ because Satan knows what happens when women come together. There were a handful of 10 women that got together and saw a scrawny little 16-year-old tent preacher back in the 1950s, and they said, we're going to get behind this guy. And that was Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. So come on now, ladies. Come on now, gentlemen. Let's lay aside all the ego trip. Never in in all my days. Back in the... I came up as a child in the days of the charismatic movement when unity, the themes of unity ran throughout the body of Christ. And when those things were brought forth in our midst, you couldn't hear it without tears in your eyes and a lump in your throat that God was saying something. Uh, But yet it was really difficult to breach that beyond denominational boundaries and so forth. But now, even in the churches of a community, even in churches of like faith and in the same organization, there is a vehement competitiveness and suspicion and guardedness that keeps us from coming together and flowing together in the body of Christ. But let me tell you something. God will put the ax at the root of that tree and bring forth a people who will reestablish the principle of the woven cord, who will reestablish the principle of the threefold cord of people coming together as he did in the early church. And Jesus in his ministry sent them out two by two. He sent them out wrapped up around in one another's lives and they traveled in apostolic companies and they laid their lives down and they led in plurality. And they brought the known world to its knees in just three generations. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. And of course, at the beginning of that passage that Kitty just read, Solomon continues his discourse remarking on the chasm of isolation that outside of Christ surrounds every one of us. He speaks of the reality of being alone even when we're in a crowd. We might be surrounded our whole life with laughter and conviviality, but in verse 10, we see that when we fall in sleep, when we fall upon death, there is none to support us, though all the world mourn our passing. It really struck me that I prepared this teaching before I knew Kim Clement had died. And it's another example, brothers and sisters, of the narrative of what we're studying, driving the experience of what's going on around us. Mm But when when we fall in death, there's none to support us. Though all the world mourn your passing, each one of us will cross that Jordan alone. And where is our solace? And where is our comfort? This is the observation of Solomon, to which the believer, the person with a redeemed intellect, see, a person with an unredeemed intellect cannot read this book without concluding Solomon was depressed and needed to be medicated. But the person with the redeemed intellect intellect knows exactly what Solomon's getting at. Where is our comfort? Our comfort is in Christ. When attending recently my father's passing, there were many observations that could be made as I sat in that hospice room and spent some hours with him by myself. And I'll be honest with you, it was not a sweet sorrow, but a bitter one. My father's body, with which he had served the master for 83 years, had betrayed and denied him, and he was incensed. How dare you? Mm -hmm. (laughs) He was. (laughs) How how dare his body presume to contradict the promise of God (laughs) for absolute health and long life? He fully intended. He just did not go quietly. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) He was frustrated. Now he's dying, but he's frustrated. He's resistant. He refused for hours to lay his head down for what he knew would be the final time. He was in pain. He was chagrined and dismissive of all the anxious, concerned faces that gathered around, obviously resigned in our expression to to the passing that he was anything but ready to yield to. 
It's like we're, we were standing uh, in, the, in the outside of the ring watching as death approached and we're ready to throw his towel in for him. And he's saying, don't you dare do that to me. In fact, he told everybody to get out of the room. <laughs> Yet in the midst of all of his agony, physically, I never once, I hear the thing about not being alone. I never once saw in my father the desperation and fear that I've seen in so many, including many who professed to believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yet at the moment of death, they feared as though they were taking a leap in the dark. Whatever the indignity of death was for my father, his unspoken, unshakable, absolute faith in the presence of God and the accompaniment of angels to attend his passing was undeniable. It was a foregone conclusion. If I read Psalm 23 to him, which I did, I read it for myself and not for him, because for him, that was a redundant sentiment. Like, tell me something I don't already know. Though all men face death, and many, many even Christians, understandably show fear at that final hour, in reality, we know that unlike those who only believe in what is found, again, Solomon's context of Ecclesiastes under the sun, we have a Savior ready at hand who says in his word that precious in his sight. And I can I can see that when I saw my father engaged in mortal combat with the angel of death himself, mm -hmm. and I can only believe that God looked down and said, that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Precious in his sight is the death of his saints. And we know in death as in life, we're not alone. Verse 13 through the end of the chapter. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. I considered all the living which walk under the sun with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been before them. They also that come after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Just to give another anecdote or two about my father's death. My dad and I, when we would have conversation, we're very pragmatic and very direct. And he knew I was in the room. And at one point he was sitting up because he absolutely refused to lay down. Uh, the greatest enemy was in the room. He wasn't going to lay down for that. <laughs> so he's sitting up and, and I'm sitting directly in front of him. And, and he, we, we locked gazes. And I said, it sucks, doesn't it, Dad? <laughs> and he looked at me and says, No. <laughs> And then just uh, a little while later, uh, the uh, God bless the hospice workers. Mm -hmm. They know how to to talk to people. And the the head of the hospice unit there came and spoke to my dad. And she didn't patronize him; that she spoke to him intelligently and in ways that helped him find his steps forward in what he was dealing with. That's right. And he rested for for a little bit. And then he, he he roused, and people were trying to talk to them, but he was somewhere else. And he lifted his hands and began to wave his hands like he was leading an orchestra. And the the worker was there, and she basically tried to solicit, like, what's that from him? He said, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's so and, beautiful. And he didn't bother to go further into an explanation. That's okay. We'll give him... <laughs> we'll give him the dignity of that. But what an awesome thing. And I said that, I think I said this on the broadcast the other day, that in the midst of all that, at one point they had him propped up on the, the bed where he was kind of sitting up uh, in the bed, not completely lying down. And in all the struggle, you just hate to see. It was very uncomfortable. His back hurt. His body ached. He couldn't get comfortable. But at a certain point, he rested, and I saw something come over him, and it was like I was looking at a patriarch on a throne. Yeah. It was like the rule of God was just oozing out of his being, and the authority 
and the royalty and the re, the regal aspect that he manifested in a moment of time, I felt like I was looking at a king. And it just so spoke to me. And then just a few hours later, we came back and he had passed. And I walked in and there was his body. And it looked for all the world like a husk of corn that the kernels had been taken out of. And I thought to myself, as I looked upon his body, wasted, uh, bereft of life, completely exhausted. And in my spirit, I, I heard, well done, good job. You didn't waste a bit of what I gave you. Amen. He, he was a good steward of that. And he left, he left everything on the table. He left everything down to his last ounce of strength, <laughs> exhausted and spent. Like he preached a message. He said, we need to be sendable, spendable, and bendable. And there was a man completely spent. When, you, when Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you, if you look that word up, you think about that. As Americans, we say, nobody's going to make me do anything. But if you look that word make up, it means spent. It's follow me and I will spend you. I will spend you. <laughs> Jesus is the only friend we actually ask him to use us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've said the last week he's a real user. He's a real user. <laughs> he likes to use you up. Pour you out like a drink offering. So Solomon, in the concluding remarks of our chapter, he talks about the vanity of riches and the fleeting nature of fame. And when man's end comes, no matter how highly he's regarded in life, it's a cold comfort in view of history. Think about the most accomplished names we could think of. Regardless what we accomplish in this life, it is a cold comfort in view of history that will only make the greatest man a mere footnote in an unread tome of history on a library shelf somewhere. Under the sun, if that is where our hope lies and the meaningfulness of existence lived out, then all is vanity, vanity and vexation of spirit. Over and over, the wisdom of Solomon calls out to us across the centuries and bids us to wake up from the stupor of a shallow existence to realize and affirm that we draw each breath as a sacrament bestowed from the hand of God himself and choose to live our lives in humility and deference to him who sits on the throne and takes up residence in our hearts on a daily basis. Glory to God. Thank you, Father, for Ecclesiastes chapter 4, more of an education. Thank you that we are, we're not just left to this life and this earth like some that have no hope, but we have a greater hope, the great hope, Father, that we have found it and you found it in us. You found a treasure and you bought the whole field and you redeemed us to yourself. Thank you, Father, for helping us to see life as so precious and valuable that we should enjoy every single day in your presence and um, spending ourselves on behalf of others for your kingdom's sake, Father, is our heart's cry. We thank you for preserving and protecting your prophets, Father, from any further poison in the pot. In Jesus' name, amen.